Hello, and welcome to GAPNA Chat, an official podcast of the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association. GAPNA Chat provides interviews and discussions with GAPNA leaders and members of the gerontological healthcare community, and will focus on advocacy, policy, education, professional development, research, and clinical care for older adults. In this episode, Dr. Cassandra Von Ess, a gerontological nurse practitioner and member of the GAPNA communication team, talks with Dr. Joanne Coleman, an acute care nurse practitioner. Dr. Coleman has worked at the John Hopkins Hospital in the Department of Surgery and the Center for Geriatric Surgery at Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, and is a member of the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association. In addition to her inspiration to become a gerontological nurse, Dr. Coleman discusses the specialty needs of the older adult undergoing surgery, the development and implementation of the Geriatric Surgical Verification Program by the American College of Surgeons, and implications for the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurse. We are pleased to present Dr. Vanessa's interview with Dr. Coleman. This episode was recorded on July 6th, 2022. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is Dr. Cassandra Von Ness, and today we have Dr. Joanne Coleman with us. She is an acute care nurse practitioner with over 38 years of surgical experience at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. She established the Center for Geriatric Surgery at Sinai Hospital. Dr. Coleman also had the opportunity to participate as the nurse member for the John A. Hartford Foundation grant that established the Geriatric Surgery Verification Program with the American College of Surgeons. She is currently retired and she joins us today to talk about some of her experiences in geriatric surgery. Welcome, Dr. Coleman. Thank you for taking time today to have a conversation with us. Oh, thank you for having me. First off, I'm very interested in your nursing path. Surgical nursing is, you know, something that I see that you have woven throughout your career. What would you have to say to an 18-year-old, Joanne, <laughs> at this point about what her future may hold for her? Well, I think the 18-year-old Joanne, looking back, had no clue where she was going to end up. <laughs> and actually, my initial degree from college was in education, for secondary education. And I don't know if you know, back in the early 70s, there were no teacher jobs available. So my mom happened to work for a company that sponsored their children to go into health professions. So I decided I'm going to go into nursing. <laughs> so I went back to school and I didn't have to take the general college courses. I only had to take the nursing courses because I already had the general ones. And so, and I actually worked at a community hospital on the weekends as what they called the ward secretaries back then. But then when I was finishing up my nursing in a community college, I actually started at, I decided to take a job at the Johns Hopkins Hospital as, as an aide like during the weekends as well. And I really, really enjoyed what I was doing at that point in time. And I was actually like on a kind of a private med surge floor that I worked on, but I realized I really liked taking care of the surgical patients. So when I finished my AA degree in nursing, I decided to work at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and go into the Department of Surgical Nursing. So that's how kind of I wound up in that particular niche for nursing. And I loved, I just loved every part of it because you meet people from all over the world. There was all kinds of patients you were taking care of. The group that I started with, I am still friends with to this day. And we actually all got together last year in Cape May, New Jersey. I took the ferry over there and met four other people that I had started working with at Johns Hopkins, my first head nurse ever, and the assistant head nurse, and then two other friends. And we've kept in communication for the last 50 years about. <laughs> and so 
I actually got put on a floor that was a bang, bang, what I call the bang, bang, shoot them up nursing gun club, because we got all the trauma kind of local trauma, but all kinds of other general surgery patients too. And so it was such a learning experience and some things you like, you don't learn in nursing school, but you know, your peers will teach you <laughs> and you will come to learn many different things. And so that's how I got into surgical nursing. Let's put it that way. And I actually worked on a surgical floor and it was kind of the resident service, so to speak, called the Halstead service, which was a great, great group of people. And then I actually went and worked in the emergency room at the Johns Hopkins Hospital for about two years. And then I decided I wanted to go back to the floor. I really like taking care of patients more in a continuity because, you know, in the emergency room, they're hi, goodbye. <laughs> when you're on the floor, you actually can, you know, take care of them. And then I decided my, actually, my girlfriend taught me, she goes, we need to go get our bachelor's degree. So we went back to get our bachelor's degree together. And right after that, I went and said, well, we'll have to do a bachelor's, let's do a master's. <laughs> so we went and did a master's. <laughs> it just kind of went on for that. And the good part is the hospital paid for our education if we would stay and work at the hospital for two years afterwards, which I thought I'm not going anywhere. So well, and now we see with the way nursing is, you know, that's an investment that, you know, really works. they got a return on their investment when it came to your education. At what part in your periop experiences did you start to see that there were specialty needs in the older adult? So fast forward, and I actually went back and got my adult nurse practitioner postmaster's certificate. And then I also did the, I just went right and did the acute care nurse practitioner as well, because at the Johns Hopkins Hospital to work inpatient, you have to be an acute care nurse practitioner. Outpatient, you can be an adult. And I actually did both so I could flip back and forth. But I was seeing patients in clinic that were getting older, it seemed to me, and then taking care of patients. And I realized one day, that 50% of the patients that were on this one floor were 65 years or older. So it had really kind of seemed to me flipped. And we were doing really, you know, major abdominal surgeries on these folks. And I realized like when we were in clinic in the preoperative assessment that, you know, they were getting their kind of look from head to toe from a surgeon's perspective, from their history and physical, but nobody was really looking at the entire patient. Like, what did they come with? Who's going to take care of them? What are their needs going to be when they go home? Are they going to be able to go home after these surgeries? So like all these questions, I'm like, why aren't we looking at them from a different, you know, like from a holistic perspective? And so that's when I decided to go back to get my doctorate the DNP at Johns Hopkins because I was the guinea pig class. <laughs> so, you know, you have to put in what's your topic going to be. And I thought, well, how about if I look at the surgical care of the older person? And so that's how all this kind of came about. And I was like fascinated because when you really looked at it and it wasn't a lot in the literature back then about care of the older surgical patient, but people were looking into it. And I realized that there was more that needed to be assessed from these cognitive, you know, the doctors would do, can they get up, can they get up on the examining table? Was there a mobility assessment? You know, and I'm like, and I think there's a little more to that, you know, and so, but I was like looking like what else could be done? And so that's how I got interested in surgical care of the older patient. And it was just fascinating. And part of my DNP capstone was to do this assessment, a more complete assessment of about 35, 40 people, I think I did. And to see, you know, what were the needs, not only of the patients and their families, but nursing. Because I realized that when patients were coming into surgery, they were coming in the day of surgery. And they would go to the operating room from the pre-op area to the, maybe the ICU, maybe back to the floor. And the nurses that were taking care of them had never laid eyes on them. So they had no clue what this patient was like. They didn't know like what their mentation was previously, you know, what their mobility level was and where was this information? So when I did the assessment, I went back and gave it to the nurses that were caring for the patients that they felt was so helpful, you know, that now they had a better clue. Like, you know, if the person woke up and they were mentating <laughs> as opposed to, and to incorporate the families because they're the ones that know the patient the best. 
you know, so they know what the patient should act like, <laughs> fortunately, or and if they weren't, were they delirious post-operatively? And why were they delirious? What were the medications they were given? You know, what was their preoperative cognitive status? Things like that, that we just hadn't looked at before. So, I mean, I kind of was pushing this and people were realizing it. And I did have one particular surgeon who was really interested in this and had done actually a pretty well-known paper on frailty assessment of the older surgical patient. And, you know, we were talking about what we could do of a more further assessment of these patients. But in the meantime, a friend had kind of sent me an email and said, you ought to look at this job I just saw come up <laughs> at this community hospital. So I kind of like looked at it and I sent my information in and they called me about coming to, um, there was a new program they were putting together about, you know, Center for Geriatric Surgery. And so it, I hemmed and I hauled and it took me about three months before I went in for, you know, um, interview. And I, when I interviewed with the chief of surgery, we found out we had a lot of people in common and a lot of things in common. And so it was a great interview. And I had to, you know, interview with a couple other people. And that night, I actually got a phone call that I didn't recognize the number and it was the chief of surgery calling me to say, and I actually did answer it. And he was him and he was saying, I really wish you would come. Cause I think we could do really, you know, be a really good team and do institute what I really want to institute. And so about three months later, I resigned and took the job as the clinical coordinator for the Sinai center for geriatric surgery, which was being established. So I got to be on the ground floor, so to speak and collaborate with the chief of surgery who was very interested in care of the older surgical patient. And kind of like a three-pronged thing, we looked at education, research, and the clinical care of the older patient. And one of my focuses was to do a really good preoperative assessment, which incorporated all the tools that had been just promulgated in, I think it was 2012 by the American College of Surgeons about the preoperative assessment of the older patient and what tools should be used. And we incorporated that and in, we had it worked with IT to put it in the EHR. So when I did assessment, it went right in. And then we looked at a thousand patients and did papers about it and came up with a little kind of compressed assessment that could be done in three things. And uh, it's just kind of snowballed from there because then I would get to educate the patients as well as the staff, as well as the residents do the research projects, and then give my talks about the preoperative assessment of the older surgical patient. And that's how that came about. <laughs> so you started out, you know, the foundation of this surgery center for geriatrics, you began with, you know, pretty much a, a comprehensive geriatric assessment that, yes, um, and then drilled down to develop some screening, because that's the hardest thing. It's, you know, so time intensive, but how do we know, you know, who really we should invest our time in? Right. So we, we actually did about 1,025 patients. We looked at all this information that had been gathered, which was on the computer, which we could look at and kind of developed. It was, I think the paper came out in 2017 in the Annals of Surgery, which was called the Sinai Abbreviated Geriatric Evaluation or SAGE. I mean, kind of lots of things are SAGE, but it's, like I said, the Sinai abbreviated geriatric evaluation. And there were three geriatric assessments instruments that we looked at that when we drilled down with the statistician proved to be the most valuable and to be done like in under five minutes or three minutes we were looking at. So you could get a lot of information. And one was the mini cog. The second was activities of daily living. And the third was gait speed. So when we looked at those and they're kind of scored on a zero to three scoring. So actually, if you got a point, that's kind of not good. So if you didn't get any points like zero, you were okay, so to speak. If you had two to three points, there was a possibility that could be delirium post-operatively. There could be mobility problems just to see. So it was kind of a down and dirty test and that, that got instituted and put in as a whole, you know, package in our electronic medical record that if people did that, maybe they could determine how well or, or not the older surgical patient would do. Uh, it doesn't even have to be an older surgical patient. It could be any patient, really. How did you make these items actionable pre-op? Was it in the pre-surgical clinic or was it in pre-admission testing? You know, how did you operationalize that was, screening? And then yeah, what did was, you do? 
I was in the preoperative testing area. So patients were seen in consult with the surgeons and they were set up for their surgery. They would be sent for their routine preoperative assessment, the history, physical, blood work, EKG. Mm -hmm. And our cutoff age was 75 years and above. So I would see all patients who were 75 years and above also for this kind of geriatric screening. And, you know, it was kind of like we have this other screening for these patients. And I never had anybody say, no, I don't want to do that. And so with the surgeons, when they became aware of it, I, they would send patients to me just to have the geriatric screening done to see if they should even consider them for surgery. <laughs> so that came about, or I get called to the surgery clinic if they wanted somebody they thought had some issues, just as a quick down and dirty. But my whole goal was to teach other people to do this as well. But I mean, I was happy to do it. And I know the person who has taken over my job subsequently is really incorporated herself in the inpatient population as well. So it was kind of, I hung out all day <laughs> in the preoperative. Was that PEC? I, I always get confused in these you know, different names that they have for the um, preoperative assessment. Ours was pre-admission yeah. testing yeah. at yeah. our facility. It was yeah. PAT. They called so, it. And that's where anesthesia, they see the pre-anesthesia right, visit. Right, too, right, so, right. Yeah. yeah. And anesthesia would come down to see patients periodically. And I would wind up calling surgeons to say, look, this, I had a gentleman that couldn't hear. I did a hearing evaluation as well. Just a quick with an audiometer, look in their ears, number one, to see if they have wax in their ears. And number two, on both ears to see, could they hear and at what, you know, decibels and stuff like that. And I had a gentleman that couldn't hear. And I actually called the surgeon and I said, I don't think he understood a word you said to him. And he actually brought the patient back and the guy admitted he did not know what was told to him. So, I mean, it was just so much for informed consent, right? Exactly. <laughs> and then I had a gentleman that couldn't hear, but he had wax, so much wax in his ear. And fortunately, we had the ENT clinic was right across the hall from where we had the preoperative <laughs> assessments done. I mean, testing done. So we sent him over there. And then I had another gentleman, I looked at his ear and there was something weird in there. <laughs> and I called my, one of my peers over and she looked in there and she went over to the NT clinic, came back with a little, I forget what it's called, but it's like a little loop thing. And we put it and the wax came out and in the wax, there was this piece of blue and it was the tip of a Bic pen, you know, like put the top and he had stuck yeah, and it. He must there. have been itch it. Oh goodness. And I goodness. was, and we found, oh, I found a hearing aid battery in the ear. I mean, it's just was like, why? Where's their primary care doctors well, in I'm, all this? Well, I'm I mean, like, they get sent to the preoperative assessment for stuff, but who looks in ears in the preoperative assessment? You know, for stuff only like an that. only a nurse practitioner would oh, do that, I mean, and especially for the older adult, because what's the percentage of people that? You know, and I know we, I had a student with me one time and she was flabbergasted because I was looking in ears and she said, oh my gosh, she said, I was in the ICU one time and they thought that this woman had had a stroke because she wasn't answering them. She wasn't like talking to them and they were talking in their ear. And when the family came in, they found out she was hard of hearing in that ear, one ear. So if they'd gone to the other side, that's the side that she could hear in. So it's just, it doesn't that take deli on That's science. delirium 101, <laughs> sensory. <laughs> so it was just, it's just kind of amazing to me. It's simple things like that, that make the biggest difference. And so the other thing is I found out, we gave out little pamphlets to the family members that I always invited the family members to come in with the assessment because I also did a caregiver burden assessment. I used the Zeret tool just to see. And I, you know, we found some that were not happy about taking care of their family member. You know, it's like, should they be followed a little more? You know, I couldn't do anything at that point in time, but I could alert at least the social worker, the case manager that they were coming in and just check on, you know, what their disposition was going to be and who was going to take care of them just to make sure that they were going to take them home. <laughs> I mean, I felt some, a couple of them, I'm not sure that this family member is going to come and take them when they need then they're able to go home because they're going to say, I can't take care of them, which may or may not be true, but at least you get an idea of where the family members or who's going to be taking care of this because somebody's going to be taking care of somebody when they get home, especially the older patients. So, cause we sent, I thought we sent everybody home with a hole, a wound, a tube, a drain, addressing a need of some sort these days, because you don't go home from the hospital with nothing attached these days. It's always something it seems like. 
So, but that was just another one. And, and we gave out pamphlets about what is delirium because to inform the family members, like if they, you know, they get scared when somebody's not acting quite like normal to them, whatever normal is, but we don't know if they're delirious or not because you never knew what they were like preoperatively. So they're like our best allies and to help us about that and let us know that this is not my family member, this is not the way they're acting so that we can then go in and do the assessment and figure out what's going on and hopefully deter that ahead of time if we know that they're a possible setup for delirium. How did you get tagged to be involved in the grant when the American College of Surgeons were beginning the groundwork for the GSV? Well, that once again is due to my boss, the chief of surgery, because he became part of the team, was invited to be part of the team because he had been very active in the American Geriatric Society. When they have the specialty ones, he was with the surgery. I hadn't written, like I said, textbooks about the principles and practices of geriatric surgery. It wasn't That was like the second edition. Anyways, so he came to me one day and he said, Joanne, I think we need a nurse on this team because there's geriatricians and there's surgeons and there's, but there's nobody from like the nursing. He said, would you be interested? And, and they sent me all the information and I said, oh yeah, sign me up. <laughs> so we, it was a four-year grant and we met initially in Chicago. I remember going to my first meeting in Chicago at the American College of Surgeons headquarters by Northwestern. Um, university and a hospital and meeting people from all over the country that were interested in the care of the older surgical patient and what the stipulations of the grant were and the grant people also from the John A. Hartford Foundation. So it was just kind of, it felt like it was overwhelming and daunting at that point, but I guess our project manager from the um, American College of Surgeons, they had it so well planned out so well. And we got to be all good friends and they're good partners and just everybody. And I always was able to put in the nursing perspective. (laughs) Well, by then you'd had several years, you know, under your belt of seeing these best practices really work. Correct. And that's, you know, being able to sell that, you know, with so many time constraints and so many processes, you know, built into workflows. That's an important element. It was really kind of eye-opening for me um, to see everybody's different perspectives. But I also was very much in the caregiver aspect as well, because that also has to be very much incorporated into the care of the older surgical patient. So, I mean, I would come with a different perspective. I remember one time, one of the surgeons said to me, he just never thought about it that way. And I'm like, duh. (laughs) But it was like, it was like, he kept like a light bulb went on for, I can't even remember what it was, but he was like, okay, now I can see where there's you know, a different perspective, you know, because the surgeons are kind of cut and dry. <laughs> so, but I appreciate it, you know, when he was saying, you know, that's why we need a nursing perspective. So I'm hoping, well, that, you know, that helped out with that whole grant. <laughs> how did they come up with the age of 75 for vulnerability? Right. Pure random. I mean, that was a big topic of conversation. We had a number of different meetings about that. 65 being, you know, social security, retirement, that kinds of stuff. 75, 85 was too old. I mean, not 85 too old, but you know, that was, that was definitely in the project 80. So 70, 75, it went back and forth. And all of a sudden just they said, we got to pick an age. And so they picked 75. Now I know that a couple of the hospitals, or at least one that I know of that's going for the geriatric surgery verification is they look at all 65 and older when they're doing their assessments. And as part of the, of their, you know, older surgical patient, they started at 65, but most everybody is for whatever reason, hooked on to 75. And like I said, that was pure random. There's no (laughs) rhyme or reason. I mean, there's no research into any of that at all. So, but we argued back and forth. (laughs) Does the comorbidities capture those 65 to 74 that maybe, you know, you would have missed because of the chronological limit, like say someone with diabetes or cardiovascular disease, you know, serious comorbidities. Does that, you know, would that play into your decision-making around the geriatric screening? 
Yes, I mean, part of when the, the screens that I did, it was you looked at all their comorbidities and, and it would have coming up with what a, a number that would say, and I can't remember exactly what it was, like how much, how vulnerable they were to be susceptible to, you know, rocky post-op course or, you know, maybe determined that they might not even make it out of the hospital, depending on what they have. I think it's 11 different. And the one thing that wasn't in that, I remember was orthopedics. Now, where I was practicing in the Center for Geriatric Surgery, it was heavily populated orthopedic, heavy population of orthopedic patients because they did a lot, a lot of hips and knees and, you know, falls patients. But the the orthopedic surgeons were coming around because they realized that just a quick assessment was really helpful (laughs) to see though, though most of them go for rehab, obviously, afterwards, but there's other things to consider, particularly with the pain management and things like that. So it was very rewarding to see when surgeons from the different specialties kind of clicked in to say, oh, this might be helpful. (laughs) Especially when there's decisions around elective surgeries, where they have that time to get that decision-making established. It seems like this is a perfect fit for an advanced practice nurse. Absolutely. Um, And I think, is that the way it was intended, the geriatric surgery verification to, whether it's clinical specialist or a nurse practitioner, someone with that, you know, advanced skills, but, and you had an opportunity to use your education background because- Exactly. (laughs) Always, always educating patients. Always educating. I know it's kind of like, I don't know. It's almost like, you know, the whole journey into being into this geriatric world, geriatric surgical world, like everything that came before kind of helped towards that. And not that it was planned, essentially. It's just kind of being, you know, I guess in the right place at the right time, being, you know, able to pursue some of the things that I wanted to do when we're looking at the older surgical patient and having the experience and being able to communicate with surgeons so, you know, it's just been a wonderful ride, <laughs> I can well, say. That's, mm-hmm. It was so nice to get an opportunity to talk to you. Do you have any final thoughts, Dr. Coleman, for our audience? Oh, I just think that, especially from the nursing perspective, you realize that you don't know everything and there's other people that have information or or smarts about things that you don't, but you know that you need to collaborate with people. You know, nothing gets done without collaboration. So you learn a lot, but you also can give a lot from what you learn. So I've learned that I can learn a lot from other people <laughs> and that I don't know it all for sure, because I think the more you know, the, you know, you know that there is the less that you know. <laughs> So, but I was like, you know, it's always a good thing to tap into all your resources and to keep everybody within your group, you know, well-informed. So I think collaboration and communication is the biggest thing that I could actually promulgate from my experience. And also, like you said, the teaching and to keep people informed and to help wherever you can, because that's the goal of nursing, obviously. And for the advanced practice nurse, you have the skills and the talent, and the discipline, and the knowledge, you know, to do all these things. So I just think you're right. It's the perfect, it's the perfect, you know, job (laughs) for an advanced practice person, be it, like you said, a clinical nurse specialist, nurse practitioner. Actually, there's PAs that have, are doing some of this as well that have an interest. So I think anybody that has that advanced degree that this works for, absolutely. So if you can, if you're looking for a job and you can find one like that, go for it. <laughs> and join GAPNA. Yes, and join GAPNA. Um, to get connected with other like-minded people that have a heart for improving the health of our older adults. So Absolutely, absolutely. I will say that as well. GAPNA is a great forum to express yourself as well as to meet other people with like interest and to keep in touch with the same people that have your like interests. So it's actually, since I retired, I've limited what I belong to and I've always remained with GAPNA. Wonderful. I hope I have an opportunity to meet you in person sometime. And thank you again, Dr. Joanne Coleman. And until next time, be kind to yourself and to one another. Thank you. 
Gapna Chat is owned and produced by the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association. All rights reserved. No portion of this podcast may be used without written permission. Dr. Joanne Coleman is an acute care nurse practitioner who worked at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in the Department of Surgery for 38 years, caring for general surgical patients and finally concentrating her care to patients with hepatobiliary and pancreatic diseases. Working with surgeons, she helped establish critical pathways, assisted with research protocols, educated nurses and residents, saw patients for preoperative evaluation, and cared for inpatients. She also helped establish the Center for Geriatric Surgery at Sinai Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland, working as the clinical program coordinator for eight years. She was selected to serve on the American College of Surgeons grant given by the John A. Hartford Foundation to develop standards for geriatric surgery and establish a new quality program the Geriatric Surgery Verification Program of the American College of Surgeons. Dr. Coleman is a member of GAPNA's Acute and Emergent Care Special Interest Group and contributed to the gerontological resources for APRNs in acute and emergent care settings. Dr. Cassandra Von S. is the Nurses Improving Care for Health System Elders, Niche Coordinator, Geriatric Oncology, at the Moffitt Cancer Center in Tampa, Florida. She is a member of the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association communication team and is a host of the Gapna Chat podcast series. For archived episodes of Gapna Chat and to learn more about the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association, visit gapna.org. You can also subscribe to Gapna Chat everywhere podcasts are found.